warm welcome. Welcome to Mixed Up Podcast, live. Woo! I'm Emma. And I'm Nicole. Um, and if you listen to the podcast, you will be familiar with this intro. But I just want to say thank you to everybody for being here because it's a big deal for us because obviously not only is it a live podcast event, but also it is the launch of our book. Woo! The half of it. Um, which we started writing four years ago. Yeah, 2020. Many years ago. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's quite a big deal for us. And, yeah, we wanted to invite you all to come and have dinner with us. So thank you so much for being here. We are looking forward to a feast cooked by the wonderful chef, Anna, who's Woo! hiding at the back there. <laughs> She's going to be introducing us to Macanese cuisine tonight. So we are very excited to chow down later. Um, but first, we've got a very, very exciting guest with us tonight. Yes, please, Anna, come and join us. <laughs> so... We are really excited because we have our friend Anna Sulan Massing here with us today. She is an incredible writer, poet, journalist, academic. Um, doing people's intros in front of them is very weird. <laughs> it's always really weird. We always do it off, like away from our guests when we do the podcast because they're like, it's just weird for everyone. Exactly. <laughs> um, but what we love about Anna's work is that it really centers around race, identity, gender. Um, and decolonizing the cultures that we live in. And of course, food is a major part of that and is a major part of uh, Anna's work, which is why we wanted her to join us today and have this amazing conversation. Thank you so much for having me. As, as, a, as a fangirl, this is super exciting. Oh, we are your fangirls, so this is great. This is really, really great. I do love it when you get to do a podcast and basically everyone's just fangirling. Yes. Yeah. We always interview people everyone's that friends. we yeah, like. <laughs> Yeah, in love with, and it's good. Um, okay, so we thought we'd do a quick icebreaker because we don't have that long to talk. Um, so we'll keep it concise. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to, yeah, for you to get to know us if you don't know us already. But for those of you who do know the answers, keep them to yourselves. <laughs> Because we're, we're kicking off with a little two truths and a lie. Um, I am a, I'm, I'm on the apps, um, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> and if you've listened to the most recent episode of the podcast, you will know that and how I feel about it. But um, I have pulled these ideas from Hinge. Um, so we're kicking off with Anna. Can you guess Emma's okay. lie in All her right. two truths and a lie? Okay, that's basic. That's how we're starting this. So, Emma, tell us your two truths and lie. Okay, let's go. Get ready. <sighs> okay, so I met my husband in Miami during happy hour. I was once sick on John Legend's shoe. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't funny. <laughs> At the time. And I've styled Solange. I think the lie is where you met your husband. Because the other two are cool and outrageous that they're the truth. <laughs> cool and very specific. Wow. Yeah. Um, unfor I mean, because I know Emma, I know that unfortunately you are wrong. <laughs> um, but maybe we can extend to the audience. I did a good can, job. Yeah, I you did a good did. job. <laughs> We can extend to the audience and maybe someone can take a, home a little copy of the book or something. Yeah. yeah. I served the straight face. Yeah, you did I'm well so being stoic. The line is that you were sick on John Lennon. Yeah, I yeah. think yeah. so too. Yeah, yeah. 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 definitely. That would be a great Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Well, because you answered first, true. you win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Winner. Very, very good poker very face. Very good very poker good. face. Really? Yeah, yeah. it was. Very very good. Good. I even knew them, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Okay, um, it's so my turn not, yeah. to give you one of the hinge prompts. Yes. 
Okay, so your prompt is, mm -hmm. you are the same kind of weird as me if. Okay, so you're the same type of weird as me if you love the ocean, you love the beach, you love open water, sand, sun, uh, but you hate seafood. Oh. You don't eat seafood. It is yeah. frankly a shock that we are still friends. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's dramatic. It is. It is dramatic. It's hard as well being Asian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like Filipino as well. Like, I know. I'm, wow. It is hard. Brave. It brave. Is, is I think you're just brave. I am brave. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> um, but now, Anna. Yeah. We need to know what your most controversial opinion is. And I feel like I'm really excited about this because I don't know what it could possibly be. Because you just seem very cool and chill. So I'm like, how could well, you we be controversial this together? Yeah. And we were like, this is going to be really... I, well, now I'm probably going to let you down. But so I decided to keep to food. Okay. So we're kind of focusing on foods, food vibes. So I, um, I hate olives. Oh, I think they are too. really shit. Me too. And <laughs> they are musty and shriveled. Musty and is the word. I'm not into them. And I like live in East London and I am what was termed as a foodie. You know, I like I spend yeah. my whole life and I don't like olives. And I think that shocks everyone. Um, I'm also very particular with crisps. They have to be crinkle cut. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> which means that I which means I don't eat a lot of crisps. So I eat some really terrible flavoured crisps because they're the only ones that are crinkle cut and I won't do anything else. Wow. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I love that. That is really niche. We love really a niche nice. response. I love that. That's amazing. I can't get behind the olives. I can't be able to get behind the crisps. I'm with you on the olives, but yeah. <laughs> I just did see uh, my friend Rebecca just look very shocked when I said about the olives. <laughs> Like, now we're not friends, so... I feel like everyone has very specific food rules. Yeah, That's the yeah. thing. So I'm not... I, I feel you on that. I do. Okay. So now we've got the really hard questions out yeah. of the way. Hard-hitting stuff. <laughs> we can, we get, can the get, stuff. We can get to the really easy stuff about identity. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, you are obviously... You're Eben and yes. Kiwi. Um, and I really love to hear more about that. Um, but I really want to talk about how that's impacted you and, and your work, which is so focused on... Um, which is so focused around identity. Um, mm. How did you discover that as, like, your kind of why and like your core yeah actually it was weird I was thinking about this um yesterday because it's um something a, a friend said to me about kind of how London is this busy and chaotic city but it's also a really lonely city you know like you can be surrounded by people and feel very alone and um so I had a theater company in my 20s and I wrote I wrote a, a piece um like a monologue about about being lonely in London. And um, when I wrote it, it was very much about like, well, then who am I and where am I going and what am I doing and why am I even here? Um, and so when I performed that piece, I was like, hang on, I want to talk about this a little bit more. And I went to an old um, uh, uh, university lecturer and said, I, I want to make this a bigger piece. I want to do something. And she said, you've just pitched me a PhD. So <laughs> make it a PhD. So that's how I ended up doing my PhD, which was about, I, like discovering or finding out really about my heritage and what did Ibanness mean to me. Because right. um, it was always such a part of my life and a, a small little everyday things. But then there was things that I'd forgotten, like I'd forgotten to speak Iban because when I, my parents split up, I moved to New Zealand and no one obviously speaks Iban in New Zealand. So Iban is like an indigenous group of people from Sarawak, which is um, a state of Malaysia on the Borneo Island. So it's super tiny and, you know, minority in within Malaysia. Um, so yeah, I lost the language and like, but I still kept, you know, my mom was really good at telling the stories and keeping that sort of alive. So then I wanted to think about it, like how did that, all of that kind of bring me to London and what did that mean? And so, yeah, I went back to Malaysia and did some research there. And, um, and yeah, so I think, but one of the things that I realized is that both, you know, Malaysia and New Zealand uh, colonial were colonial spaces and everything within colonial spaces, you know, dreams of England, you know, like the law is British. Like, the, I was taught in a school in Malaysia, a primary school in Malaysia, in English, 
you know, like the stories we had, the Christmas cards are still white Christmases, you know, like, so you're constantly dreaming of England. And, and so then like, you just, you, ha you end up being here because that's, you're, you're told it's your motherland, right? Um, to, the, to the detriment of the stories that are in those places sometimes, or most of the time. So I think that was, yeah. That's really interesting because you also said, I read something of yours recently that talks about identity changing or um, shifting depending on the location or the space that you inhabit. And obviously now you've lived in the UK for 20, is it 20 years yeah, or over 20 years? years? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I've, I've also been here now for like over 13 years, which is crazy to think about. But yeah, what does that look like for you? Have you felt that way about just how you are? Yeah, in this actually food was the best way for me to think about yeah. this kind of changing identity. Because when you, um, when you leave home or when you think about food uh, from your childhood or, you know, you think about this particular dish. So for me, like um, Malaysian chicken curry, it's got, uh, you know, chicken and it's got potatoes, it's gravy and you have it with rice. Like what, is, what does that mean to you? Like and everyone has a different answer. So everyone's kind of like, well, it's, got, it's about the ratio between the potatoes and the chicken. <laughs> and someone else is like, no, 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 the gravy's got to be this yeah. consistency, you know, all that kind of stuff. So then when you, when you leave and then when, you, when you're cooking as a grown up in a different place with different ingredients and different things, you then take what that meaning of like chicken curry is and whether that's like the potato or the gravy. And so it might look totally different to what your mum made or your grandmother made or your dad made at home, but you're like the essence is there because the potatoes are correct, right. you know? Um, and whereas someone else would be like, that, that doesn't look like anything like chicken, like yeah. chicken curry. So it's this idea that like when you're, when you're, you're you know, the stories that you hold on to from, from a childhood or your, your history, and that can be kind of generational as well, right? And, and so what, what are those stories that you hold on to? What are the things that you, you know, associate with your identity um, that are really important? And for me, it's, it's very much like food is, is crucial to that and the sharing of food. Um, but it's also this like spirit, this, the Ibanna spirit, which is slightly chaotic, loves a party, <laughs> but also really hardworking and also believes in spirits and ghosts. <laughs> so I'm all woo woo, you know, like everything. <laughs> we is love like, a bit of woo. Yeah, we do like, love a bit of woo. Yeah. Yeah. So what's now your, we do. Yeah. yeah exactly. I didn't before. Yeah. <laughs> I do now. She's so like, you know, everything. So, you know, and my grandma used to be like, well, one time I was staying with my grandma and she was like, oh, uh, I've invited your, your cousin to stay. And my cousin was like 17. And I was like, why? And she was like, you're not strong enough for the ghosts. Oh, wow. I was like late 20s. <laughs> yeah. I was like, so insulted. So, yeah. So, you know, so I'm, it's really embedded in me. And that's what being Iban is, you know, like that's what I cling on to. The, the ghost stories, the spirits, the talking to the, you know, the world around you. It's fantastic. I feel like that leads us nicely on to the idea of connecting to heritage through food. And we actually have a chapter in our book a nice little plug for the book, um, which is recipes. And we, yeah, we wanted to reach out to mixed heritage chefs so that we could get recipes in the book because we found that it did seem to be a reoccurring theme that people could connect to their heritage through food. And it was kind of this really like low touch, easy access way to kind of explore your ancestry and heritage in, in a way that feels tangible um, and reachable, especially if you do feel displaced or detached, you know, you don't necessarily have a parent or a grandparent who can really give you that, excuse the pun, like taste of home, um, so to speak. And something that I heard you talking about on, or that I saw connected with your own podcast, mm. Taste of Place, um, was this idea that, you know, we have to be careful of voyeurism, yeah. um, you know, because these nostalgic memories can oftentimes be wrapped up in colonial scars, I think you, you called it, which I thought was like so insightful and interesting. I wondered if you could, yeah, talk to us a little bit about that. And I mean, it's obvious that you still think you can have a really positive relationship with food when it comes to exploring mm -hmm 
ancestry. But yeah, I kind of want to, I thought that was an interesting idea. Yeah, I think like for me, it's, um, I'm really, I get quite obsessed about like certain detail or a specific yeah. thing. So I've always looked at like ingredients and then followed an ingredient and how that kind of traveled and stuff. So yeah, so Taste to Place is about the history of pepper, but it's all about like kind of pepper and Sarawak and how it got there and, and that sort of stuff as well. And one of the things that like, yeah, we, we're trying, when you are a diaspora or, um, and mixed heritage or mixed cultures as well, like I think people who are, you know, are born here, um, even if they're not mixed, are, are, you know, a part of multiple cultures, right? And so they're always going sort of home. And you, you, are, you are an outsider, even if you're an insider as well, when you, you know, go home. And, and I think that thing of like really recognizing that you're coming from a Western perspective, if you've been predominantly grown up in the West, even if you've grown up really anchored to a non-Western culture, you still had that kind of Western, um, you know, influences and stuff. And one of the things I remember going back and like, you, you constantly, you think you've worked all this out, you've done all the reading, you do stuff, and then you go back and you're just like, oh God, I'm such an idiot. Um, and so I remember there was only, you know, two years ago, and I went back and I was talking to um, a woman who makes Luxa in one of the, the towns that I, you know, my family is from. And I was like, oh, this is so amazing. Like, how long does it take you to make this? And she's like, I use a packet. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you've just killed me. Yeah. <laughs> what is this authenticity? Yeah. It's all gone. My entire identity is ruined. Um, and then I was like, but what? Wouldn't she? Like, yeah. what? Like, she is up. Her luxor is ready at six thirty for everyone to eat before they go to work. You know, like, whose labor am I valuing here? I want her to labor over something so I can feel good about my nostalgia. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like, what is this? And also, all the all the packets are made. They're, this, they're not big, like, industrial. It's not Nestle making this. It's yeah. small, like, companies, you know. And also, she gets the laksa paste, then she fries, she does all the things for herself with it. Um, and her laksa is so different than you get anywhere else, even if they're using the same laksa paste, you know, because, right. again, it's, it's an ingredient. And it just, it really, like, it was such a jolt of, like, what, are, what am I taking and whose labor am I after, you know? And so really trying to, and, like, think about food when you are connecting with it, from a from a heritage perspective and it's such a beautiful way because it's you know food and, and taste and scent and texture you know those crisps I'm sure it's because like <laughs> from a kid that's all we had I don't know you know like like yeah. everything is, it's so tactile and um, they all they all matter and they all help you connect with things but also being kind of critical and thinking about why that nostal what that nostalgia means to you and why it's important I think is is, is, yeah, it's, it's, it's key to that investigation. And also makes it a lot richer and then you understand things a lot better. And Yeah. yeah. Well, you also have a book coming out. <laughs> it's very exciting. <laughs> Chinese and Other Asian, which is yeah. out next year. Excellent name. Such a great name. <laughs> Beautiful cover as well. Thank you. Um, but I was reading a stat on NBC America the other day, NBC Asian America, I should say, um, and it was talking about how um, Southeast Asian Americans are facing the brunt of racism in the category of Asian people in the US uh, the most, which I thought was really interesting to interrogate, I think, from the angle of your book, um, as well as kind of looking into how East Asian, Southeast Asian people are perceived and received here in the UK. Um, because I feel like, again, kind of post COVID, we had this very bizarre kind of like yellow peril 2.0 moment. Um, and yeah, I was interested to see if what you've noticed and what you've uncovered in your work and research or anything like that. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's interesting because COVID and that response during COVID was kind of the Kickstarter for this book and why this book should be written. And I originally, we know we wanted to write it really fast and really address that. Um, but then publishing is difficult, writing a book is difficult. So, you know, it, it, 
it took a little longer and actually yeah exactly and then once I started looking at it I was like actually this is just another situation that has happened repeatedly and when we think there's a bit in your book um that I and I've got your book here it's like all like post-it noted it's it's so good um and (laughs) and underlined and everything um but there's a bit where you talk about kind of like uh East Asian and Southeast Asian kind of representation and like the kind of um, around sort of like gender and masculinity yeah. and that. And one of the things that I realized when I was um, doing this research is that all this stuff and like and how uh, East and Southeast Asia is represented in the West through war films in particular. That's yes. what you were talking about, right? Which I also mentioned in my book. But like that is still off the ba- off the back of the stuff that was happening in the Victorian times, like Madame Butterfly was, right. you know, as an opera about war and and, and 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 Japan. And so you have these kind of continuous, like the same themes come out continuously. So like when you think about all the language that was, uh, was coming, uh, being written about here from like Dickens talking about opium dens, right. that is the same language that was then used again in like the 60s, the 80s, the 90s when talking about MSG and Chinese mm-hmm. restaurants. Right. And then the same kind of language that was happening here um, around uh, mad cow disease, which for some reason decided to get blamed on Chinese restaurants. And then it's the same language that's being used in regards to COVID. It's like this this foreignness is going to poison the local population. Right. And it's just like, oh, it's so co- the COVID situation, it's going to happen again yeah. unless we really talk about it and deal with it. Yeah. And that was and that was the thing. I was just like, oh, cool. It's just another, you know, yeah. another thing. Yeah. Um, and and it is interesting. And, and one of those things that you think about is that like these I think media, you know, plays such a huge part in this because it's the headlines of, you know, MSG or mad cow disease or COVID, you know. Then they print the correction on page five yeah. like this. And no, so, so the narrative is already there and no one, challenged, no one can challenge the narrative. But I do think that's changing. Like, like your book, like my book, like there are these things happening and it is, it is changing. The narrative is changing. Yeah, I think though, you know, especially doing this book, I'm still, I still get shocked about the things I found out whilst researching for this book, Mm -hmm. you know, speaking to this subject, you know, learning about the Chinese seamen being, you know, sent away um, when they'd literally been brought over here and their families not having any awareness of where they'd gone or like, you know, literally just disappearing overnight and this kind of constant demonization that happens again and again and and sometimes in this very clandestine way where like you know even now I think that was like the 40s or something and you know I feel like I'm only just learning about this now um so yeah I mean books like ours you know are slowly trickling out but um yeah I just think there's like so much more to... It's so shocking, but also the, the, the situation with the Chinese um, seamen is because it was, like, kept secret. Yeah, so there yeah. are so many things that we're not going to... We don't know has happened, and we won't find out, you know? And that's... So there's so much structural secrecy that is happening, yeah. and, you know, and, that's, and that's quite scary. When I was reading stuff, I kept just being like, oh, God, <laughs> like, yeah. what, are we, what do we not what know? What else do we not yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I just wanted quickly to go back to Pepper, actually. Will you talk to us a little bit about Pepper? Because I found it fascinating that you kind of used Pepper um, in some of the work that you've done to talk about, like, the links between how we well, how Western culture exoticizes non-Western cultures and food and other things, and then, like, the inextricable links to colonization and how you can kind of trace this or map this stuff by an ingredient's journey, um, I thought was quite fascinating. Yeah, I I sort of stumbled across Pepper in a way um, because... I saw it in a French market, Sarawak pepper in a French market, and I was like, do you know where Sarawak is? <laughs> like, you know, no one knows this. And they were kind of like, 
la, la, exo you know, exotic, 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 Borneo headhunters, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's kind of what Sarawak and Iban's are known for. They were known as the headhunters of Borneo. And, and so I was like, hang on, why is pepper being, why is Sarawak pepper being put on Michelin star restaurants and in these French markets and all this kind of stuff? So that led me down a path and I was like, and I, was, and I didn't really know what Sarawak pepper was, like that it was this really high end, incredibly beautiful stuff. And I just sort of knew we had it and, and you know. Um, and then once I, yeah, went down that route, I found out all these amazing things. But pepper really, you know, I think pepper kicked off colonialism. So the East India Company, the British East India Company, English, sorry, England East India Company, um, was the first really major company, people had stocks in, um, that, that created this um, world that... Uh, was entirely based, like they, they conquered lands, it was entirely based on creating profit. So it was incorporated um, in 1600 by, um, uh, by um, Elizabeth I, and they were given kind of a monopoly, um, and I think it was 15 years, and then, and then, and her, and then um, James I said they could have it, as long as they continued making profit, they could have the monopoly of wherever they sort of conquered. This is like so vague, but anyway. Anyway, but the first um, trip they did was to go to um, India, to Kerala, right. to get pepper. Like that was because pepper was so valuable and spices were so valuable, which is why like everyone wanted to cut out the middleman to get spices. And so that was like the whole trip of why, you know, Americas was discovered and why the Portuguese got to Kerala. It was all, it was all to, to get spices, to make money. And so that's why I think like pepper really kicked off colonialism. If, if people weren't so obsessed with pepper, then we, you know, I mean, we probably would, but you know, like, you know, like that was, that's my kind of lynch point of like yeah. that, you know, so the first, the first ships came back from the East India Company and, um, and yeah, it was, it was laden with pepper. But the other thing about that was also that lot of that pepper was also stolen and pirated. They didn't actually go and trade. They like raided Portuguese ships and like the East India Company and lots of, you know, the, the, the empire and the, the, the British, the government, like they were, yeah, they were pirates, really, you know. So it's, uh, yeah, they were, they were pirating all over the place, really. But the other thing about pepper, which also is exciting, I think, is that we think of Europe going and discovering all these, you know, quotation marks, discovering all these places and getting all these, these delicious things and bringing them back. But actually, there's a massive... Um, a really dynamic trade route already happening. Like, you know, East and Southeast Asia and South Asia had already developed this incredible trade route that actually Europe were like tapping into. They're the kind of poor cousins of the really, really dy dynamic and sophisticated trade that was happening already. And like there are um, rivers, in chi rivers and streets in China named, uh, sorry, streets in China named after rivers in Sarawak, oh. you know, around the 500. So like, that was, they were already known. It was already known. So we didn't discover, obviously, we didn't discover anything for sure. But like even, we didn't even discover global trade. Like it's such a fallacy so joke. Yeah. It is really interesting because even, you know, the different ways in which food can tell us things about mm. different people's migration, all of these things. We interviewed someone on the podcast and, you know, we were basically learning about how her people, the Hakka people, they are people who are all about survival mm -hmm. and their food literally mimics their journey, their existence, their lives. And yeah, I just think it's really interesting how much you can learn from food and food cultures. Yeah, which I think like Anna's food is gonna be, like that's what we're gonna, Yes. Experience exactly. Yeah, we're going to experience. The food is amazing for ourselves. Anna has her own story. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, she will tell us it shortly. Maybe she'll come around and tell us. <laughs> She's done this. <laughs> Maybe we'll have to tell you. You can also read the book. Yeah, She's in the book. Exactly. Um, I think this has been amazing. Probably. Yeah, we're we're at time, which Thank is you so much such a shame, you. but because we could talk to you for ages. Yes. <laughs> um, and but that was really incredible and thank you so much for being our guest tonight thank you for having me thank you so much thank you thank you
you again, everyone, for being here. Um, we're now going to eat. I'm excited. <laughs> I can't wait. But yeah, thank you again for being here. And yeah, QR codes are on the table if you're interested. And bon appetit, everybody. <laughs>